All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the How to Conduct the ANSI Z358.1 Annual Inspection Webinar. Uh, please, uh, if you experience any technical difficulties, uh, follow the link below to uh, help with your troubleshooting issues. Um, if you have any questions at any time during the webinar, please use the questions section on the control panel. We will have a Q&A session at the end to address these. Any questions we don't get to in time will be answered in a follow-up email, so don't be shy. The webinar will be recorded and available on demand and sent to you in a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours after the live presentation. Poll questions will be launched throughout the presentation. Your participation is greatly appreciated. There are five questions total, and these help us to continue to improve our webinars and our services. Uh, your participation is truly greatly appreciated on those. I am your host, Justin Dunn. I am the sales product specialist and trainer for Haas. With me is Samantha Hoke, our marketing communication strategist. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to be here. So today our agenda will include the importance of providing the proper first aid, uh, ANSI ISE uh, EA Z358.1 requirements, how to conduct the test, compliance best practices, and then we'll end the session with a live Q&A. And we'll start off with poll question number one. Thanks, Justin. First off, we'd like to know what is your job function as it pertains to emergency showers and eye washes? Do you perform the weekly and annual required testing? Do you oversee the weekly and annual required testing? Are you a consultant needing information on ANSI compliance for your customers? Are you a specifier needing information on equipment compliance or none of the above? As we go through these polls, as Justin said, we'll have another four throughout the presentation. I'm going to allow approximately 30 to 45 seconds just so everybody has a chance to answer. Great, thank you everybody. Back to you, Justin. Okay, so uh, our goal in following the ANSI standard and conducting annual tests is to mitigate injuries uh, and fatalities, lower general workplace risk, and reduce lost time and money for both the employee and for the employer. Um, we're essentially, we're sending people home safely and helping to uh, save livelihoods. Uh, OSHA has stepped up enforcement, uh, particularly for employees, uh, employers who have a history of serious or repeated violations. The uh, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, uh, their standard is 29 CFR 1910.151. And verbatim requires that where the eyes or body of any person uh, may be exposed to injurious corrosive materials, suitable facilities for quick drenching or flushing of the eyes and body shall be provided within the work area for immediate use. Um, some states require emergency eye wash and shower equipment uh, in places where irritants and chemicals are toxic by absorption. Uh, California is a really good example of that. Now the ANSI, uh, or American National Standards Institute, adopted Z358.1, which was written by the ISEA, uh, or International Safety Equipment Association, uh, and defines emergency eye wash and shower design location and temperature requirements for proper functionality and usage. OSHA references the ANSI standard during site inspections and violation reporting and is the recognized source for guidance to comply with OSHA 1910.151C. Uh, but it is important to add that OSHA has not officially adopted Z358.1 uh, as their own, uh, but again it is cited as the primary source for compliance with 29 CFR 1910.151C. Now, OSHA fines have increased for the first time since 1990 by 80%. This went into effect on August 1st, 2016, last year. 
Um, for example, a penalty for a willful violation rises from the old fine of $70,000 to $126,000 now. This means that uh, getting your teams on board and testing for compliance is even more important than ever. Uh, I really hate seeing fines progress this far because it means there is emergency equipment, first aid equipment uh, out there that's not doing its job. And if someone can't access proper first aid, then depending on the type of hazard uh, they're dealing with, their life could be in serious jeopardy or uh, seriously changed forever. In addition to that, Justin, we uh, here at Haas do main, uh, keep an eye out for some OSHA fines specifically related to equipment uh, that we manufacture, eye washes and showers, and uh, not just after the increase, but before the increase. We're seeing fines related to a single uh, non-compliant piece of emergency eye wash and shower equipment upwards of $108,000. That was the last fine that I found. Um, this is public record on OSHA's website so you guys are able to check that information out but just definitely something to keep in mind and typically you're seeing those fines per piece of non-compliant equipment so if you have 10 eye washes that's times 10. And that's a really good point. When you're looking at the potential for a $126,000 fine or even in the tens of thousands um, versus purchasing a, a new piece of emergency equipment, first aid equipment for a couple thousand dollars, it's really kind of a no-brainer when you think of just, just doing the upgrade rather than facing the potential fines. All right now, uh, Samantha, if you would launch the next poll question, please. Absolutely. All right, we'd like to ask you guys before we get into the meat of our webinar today, were you aware that there are weekly testing requirements for emergency eye washes and showers? Great, thanks for answering everybody. All right, and again, thank you for your participation with those. Uh, let's get into the significant requirements. <clears throat> so ANSI Z358 requires all emergency showers and eye wash equipment uh, be inspected on, a, um, on an annual basis. Uh, this was first, the ANSI standard was first uh, published in 1981. It was revised in 1990, 1998, 2004, 2009, and 2014. So approximately once every five or six years we get a revision to the standard. Uh, in 2009 the revision included a temperature range for water delivery, simultaneous use, and eyewash testing requirements. All three of those were huge massively important changes to the uh, ANSI standard. Uh, in 2014, the revision included design, manufactured installation of emergency showers, equipment installation location, and adjusted measurements. Uh, these applied heavily to the manufacturers of equipment. Uh, the next revision could include tighter temperature restrictions, expanded testing requirements. Uh, I could rattle off a bunch of uh, suggestions for changes. Um, as one of the largest manufacturers in the world of safety equipment, we'll be sure to stay on top of any changes and help to keep you informed. And in that 2009 revision, uh, when they added a temperature range for water delivery previously in all those other revisions, they just said tepid water is required. So luckily, they're really working on tightening up these requirements. Uh, we'll get into what the temperature range is. Um, but like Justin said, ideally we're hoping as a manufacturer and of course for users um, and building owners uh, that they do tighten up these regulations to provide you know, more comfortable experiences in our type of equipment. Now, uh, as we get into the, the significant requirements, uh, I'm going to list each requirement, uh, and then I'm going to explain how specifically to test the equipment for any issues regarding that requirement. So we'll have a slide for the requirement, and then immediately how to test for that requirement. So again, ANSI requires all emergency shower and eye face wash equipment 
uh, be inspected annually to ensure conformance with all applicable requirements of the standard. Uh, weekly testing is also required and we'll go over those requirements um, a little later on in the webinar. The annual test is a top to bottom test. Everything needs to be evaluated at this point. So to begin with, uh, these are some of the tools you are going to need. Uh, first of all, a tape measure, eyewash gauge, pause bottle 9015, five gallon bucket with a two gallon water line marked, a shower sock and pole, thermometer, and the ANSI Z358.1 checklist so you can track your progress. Um, this is all included in the 9011 ANSI testing kit that we offer. And Justin, I just am going to send you all the link to that uh, model 9011 through the chat box. That's perfect, thank you. And uh, so make sure you don't wear your good loafers because you're going to get a little wet. Okay, so on the installation of showers and combination units, the shower head must be 82 to 96 inches above the surface floor of the user. Whatever surface the user is standing on is where you need to be measuring from. The actuator and pull rod must be no more than 69 inches above the surface floor of the user. Uh, it's safe to assume that most tall people could reach uh, the pull rod at any reasonable height, which is why the pull rod is set to a maximum height, so that the uh, shorter among us are able to activate the equipment as well. To test this, you will need to take a tape measure and measure from the, again, the surface floor of the user to the bottom of the shower bell. And uh, equally for the pull rod, it's the exact same process. You're going to measure from the surface floor of the user to the bottom of the pull rod, as you're seeing there on the right. Next is the alignment of the shower and eye wash, or our eye face wash for simultaneous use. Um, this one's incredibly important to me, and I'll explain why. Uh, test and check that the eye wash and shower are aligned for simultaneous use by the same person. This is unfortunately a really common issue. Installers of the equipment are unaware of the requirements uh, and treat the shower and eye or eye face wash as separate pieces of equipment to be used in separate instances. Um, their intention, however, is to be used at the exact same time for one person. Uh, otherwise, someone is going to be forced to play the game of saving either your eyesight or your skin, and we don't want to force anybody to have to make that decision. So before we move forward, um, I'm getting a couple questions and just want to quickly clarify for those of you who may not know the difference between an eye wash and an eye face wash. So really quickly, an eye face wash is designed, as it sounds, only to cover, protect, and flush the eyeballs. Uh, an eye face wash is typically designed by manufacturers to cover all of the eyes and uh, the entire face as well. Uh, some manufacturers have different designs that don't necessarily cover the full face, so it's important that when you are picking a piece of equipment, ensure that there is full coverage. Um, just want to clarify that before we move on. We do use the terminology eye face wash very commonly throughout this presentation because Haas, as a manufacturer, uh, we only create uh, we only manufacture eye face washes for full coverage versus just eye washes. That's a really good point and uh, uh, on this slide you can see the differences between an eye wash on the right side and an eye face wash on the left side. Unfortunately the, the dust caps on but you get the, the, uh, the idea here. Um, and uh, eye face washes are very surely becoming the industry standard. Um, on equipment as they should be because the, the likelihood that you're going to spray something directly in your eyes and not on your face, in your hair, neck, etc. is is just ridiculous. There's no way that's going to, you're going to, you're going to get that that accurate and likely you're going to be wearing uh, safety glasses. So washing your face and rinsing the chemicals off of that too is, is really important. Uh, so on this page, uh, nozzles, outlets, and stored flushing fluids must be protected against airborne contaminants. Um, to test this, you're really just ensuring that the dust caps and covers are the correct fit and they are in place. We're trying to avoid clogging and buildup, uh, also preventing contaminants from shooting up into the victim's eyes that may have stored and 
are slowly releasing during the wash inside of the equipment. Portable units, of course, have stored flushing fluid. So their dust covers need to be checked as well to prevent contamination of the water inside of the unit. Uh, replacements for all of this equipment can be purchased through their respective manufacturers. All forms of emergency first aid equipment must be accessible within 10 seconds, be located on the same level as the hazard, and be free of obstructions. There is one um, exception to this rule, uh, that it be located on the same level as the hazard, and it was included in Appendix B to the standard in, under installation considerations. A single step into an enclosure where the equipment can be uh, accessed is not considered to be an obstruction. But this is only where an enclosure is present. So booth type equipment, um, anything that is protected from the environment, uh, it's reasonable to think that somebody would expect a step when stepping into a booth type of situation. But where there is no step allowed, anything you need to step over or onto is considered a tripping hazard. You need to assume whoever it is that's using the equipment or trying to find it will need to reach it without their eyesight. I need an eye wash. That's probably a fair assumption that I'm not going to be able to see very clearly. And we don't need to create an obstacle course for whoever it is that's trying to find a piece of first aid emergency equipment. So it needs to be accessible within 10 seconds. Uh, simply check the proximity to the hazard. Appendix B, five in the standard, uh, gives us a distance of 55 feet. The average distance a human can cover in 10 seconds. So you can either measure by, I would, I suggest sticking to the 55 feet. It's a much easier metric to measure by than just having somebody run as fast as they can across your facility. Um, it needs to be located on the same level as the hazard. Uh, just confirm that the equipment on is, the, is on the equal level as the potential hazard. So no changes in level or stairs. It must be on the exact same flush level as the, as the hazard. It needs to be free of obstructions. Ensure no obstructions are on the path of travel to the equipment. Uh, watch for hoses and piping are really common ones. Emergency equipment, with the exception of weekly and annual testing, should sit, uh, we really hope, for a long time without real first aid use. So it will unfortunately accumulate junk around it, uh, and people will forget, um, which is why your subject matter experts, whoever's doing your testing on a weekly basis, should be watching for obstructions in place. Just to touch on the accessibility within 10 seconds, that typically is one of the hardest parts of the standard uh, because we as a manufacturer don't know what and where your hazards are. So a recommendation to be able to determine where you should be installing this type of equipment is to uh, analyze, do, do a hazard analysis and identify where your hazards are located within your facility and then work with your uh, safety person, your safety manager. They should be able to help with the distance and the 55 feet and again identifying hazards. So um, we as manufacturers, if we are on site in your facility, we can always provide recommendations but you are truly the experts as to where your hazards lie. You're absolutely right, and uh, your safety needs your safety team needs to be involved, and whoever your subject matter experts are in the facility, you after this this webinar uh, should be involved as far as uh, positioning and placement of emergency equipment. Next, uh, the equipment. I'm going to cut you off really quick. We just got a really good question um, to touch on about the doors. Uh, is a flap door considered an obstruction, like a saloon-like door? A saloon-like door is not considered an obstruction. There is an exception in the appendix that a single door is allowed in the path between the hazard and the emergency equipment, but the door must be non-locking and it must move, it must open in the direction to the emergency equipment. So as long as it meets those two tight, it has to also have a panic bar on it. It can't have a doorknob or anything like that. It can be free swinging, that's absolutely fine. Um, if it does latch close, it has to have a panic bar and be non-locking. Uh, those are the those are the exceptions to this rule. So as long as you have that in place, uh, a single door is allowed between the hazard and the equipment. Okay, so uh, next, uh, the equipment needs to be well lit 
and identified, easily identified with highly visible signage and needs to deliver flushing fluid for a full 15 minutes. Uh, even emergency first responders will make sure that you receive a full 15 minute flush before removing you to uh, emergency services hospital nearby. It needs to go from off to on in one second or less and remain on without the use of the operator's hands. Uh, this is often confused with um, a single motion, but s multiple motions are allowed as long as they are under one second. Some state laws do differ though. Also the use of the equipment without the continual use of your hands is very important. While the water is running, you should be disrobing. Contaminants can get trapped underneath your uh, clothing against your skin. And, uh, and this of course frees up your hands to hold your eyes open during an emergency. So for the testing portion of this, uh, on the signage, just ensure that the signage is highly visible and uh, that you have adequate lighting. Uh, making the equipment as easy to find as possible is incredibly important. Again, somebody doesn't have the full use of their site potentially, so we want to make it as easy to find as possible. The flushing fluid, you need to run each piece of equipment for a full 15 minutes. This is usually where I get a whole bunch of questions. The next set of requirements can be tested during this 15 minute flow, but to touch on that, 306 to 345 gallons is hard to capture and it's going to go somewhere, uh, which makes this a requirement that isn't often adhered to, uh, especially if it's indoors uh, or not near a, uh, an accessible drain. There are devices that can help you capture this water. Uh, they're out there. Uh, this test has to be done to ensure the equipment will operate for the full 15 minutes in the event of an emergency. We don't want to something to happen during this time where somebody's not able to get their full 15 minute flush. So to uh, test and evaluate this, um, activate and assure the uh, water flow is um, flows to the unit in one second or less. This can be uh, assessed as you activate uh, in unit in the next steps. Um, this and the following uh, can be tested during the 15 minute flow and uh, it's just best to uh, again run the unit for the full 15 minutes. It's only once a year and I know it's a pain but it really needs to be done. Okay, so it must provide a controlled flow at a flushing fluid at a velocity enough to be non-injurious to the user. Uh, this can be confirmed by ensuring the flow rate and pattern requirements are met uh, again in the upcoming slides. Uh, but while we are on the subject, the, uh, the shower has a 20 gallon per minute minimum flow rate. Uh, back, briefly, back briefly to my uh, the next revision of the standard, I would love to see some maximums added. Uh, ANSI sets a lot of minimums in their standard. Uh, anyways, the shower must also have a spray pattern that is 20 inches wide at 60 inches above the surface floor of the user. This is based on an average human shoulder width. And the same with this, and I'll explain. The flushing fluid uh, for the eye washes and eye face wash uh, need to cover the areas between the interior and the exterior of a gauge at some point less than 8 inches above the eye wash nozzle. This gauge is taken straight from the ANSI standard. Uh, Z358.1 explains exactly what this gauge should look like, and it's based on the average human eye spacing. And Justin, again, I just added the link to the Hawes eye wash gauges that you can uh, purchase. I added that in the chat box on your control panel. Perfect, thank you. Okay, to, uh, to use the gauge, measure eight inches above the eye or eye face wash and slowly move the gauge down until the streams align with the gauge. This is really easily, really easy to do. Um, just measure up eight inches, slowly move the gauge down as you can see in the, in the photo. And uh, as long as the eye wash streams align with the gauge, then you're, you're good to go. Now an eye wash for the flow rates must meet 0 0.4 gallons per minute or 1.4 liters per minute for our friends up north. And an eye face wash 
uh, since it is both washing out your eyes and your entire face, has to meet a much higher GPM at 3 gallons per minute. 11.4 liters per minute. On the right, uh, you will see an example of a low flow and an injurious flow. These issues are really far too common. Again, maximum flow rates uh, would be on my wish list to ANSI. Uh, the current minimums um, on, the, on the right you can see are not being adhered to. This makes for a really uh, uncomfortable experience for anybody uh, having to use this equipment um, or obviously not having enough flow to wash out your eyes at all. Uh, the one on the bottom right, I, I would suggest just picking which eye you want to save. This test is done at the same time as the 8 inches or less test. Uh, if the streams from the eye or eye face wash meet the gauge at some point under 8 inches, then we can assume the gallons per minute flow rate is over the, uh, over the minimum. Um, so this is super easy to do. In conjunction with the test that you were doing previously, lowering the gauge, as long as it meets that gauge um, and is capable of rinsing both eyes at the same time, you are meeting the GPM requirement for the standard. This one's very easy. Next, uh, it needs to be arranged so that the flushing fluid flow pattern is not less than 33 inches and no greater than 53 inches from the surface floor of the user. This really helps us uh, avoid um, injurious flow rates, um, like the picture I showed you before. Eye wash streams, eye face washes shooting out across the room are super common um, and is not going to feel very good if somebody has to use that. So the 2009 revision set the maximum height at 45 inches, but that was to uh, the top of the eye wash head and didn't account for the stream. This meant that there was nothing limiting the stream height, which led to, again, those injurious flows. Lastly, the minimum distance, the eye face wash heads from the wall, needs to be 6 inches. And this is just to prevent anyone from hitting their head while trying to use it. That's all. Okay, so on this, uh, the flow pattern, again, 33 to 53 inches, uh, needs to be within that range. Use the tape measure to check the point where the eye wash flow uh, meets the eye circles on the eye wash gauge, uh, then from there to the surface floor of the user. Always measure from the surface floor of the user. Next, the minimum distance eye face wash heads from the wall. Uh, again, just use a tape measure to check. Uh, it's from the eye wash head, not from the bowl, is what the requirement requires. Okay, so the shower head, uh, these are the minimum flow rates for the shower and for a combination unit. Uh, on the shower head, it's 20 gallons per minute is the minimum. Again, there's no maximum here, which is really unfortunate. I would, if, again, if we referred to my wish list, I would have a maximum set for the gallons per minute because if it gets too extreme, you're creating, again, a really uncomfortable experience for somebody that has to sit under 30 plus gallons per minute pouring down on their, on the back of their head and neck and shoulders. Uh, for a combination unit, uh, first at, for simultaneous use, for a shower and eye wash, uh, you're looking at 20.4 gallons per minute, and for a shower and eye face wash, you're looking at 23 gallons per minute combined between the two. Like I mentioned earlier, these are the minimums set for the flow rates. Uh, next. The uh, test, to test the shower flow rate, uh, you will need a, what I mentioned earlier, the five gallon bucket with the two gallon water line marked, a shower sock or pole, something to control that water, or again, you're going to have a really wet, really uncomfortable day because these are designed to drench you as quickly as possible. You're going to get wet. So uh, something to control that is absolutely needed, uh, and a thermometer. Uh, to test, place the thermometer in the bucket. Place a shower sock around the shower head and into the bucket. Activate the shower for exactly six seconds. Check that the two gallon water, line, water level mark on the bucket is met. Two gallons and six seconds times 10 is 20 gallons and one minute. Uh, it's the same concept as somebody checking your pulse at the, at the hospital. So the flow pattern. Uh, again, 33 to 53 inches. 
And uh, on the showerhead water distribution, uh, also reiterating what I covered earlier, the spray pattern must be 20 inches wide at 60 inches above the ground. This is uh, an incredibly easy um, one to test, uh, but you're a lot more likely to get wet since the spray pattern, you can't control it during the test. Uh, with the shower soccer, you won't know what the actual spray pattern is. So testing is simple. Uh, just activate the shower, measure 60 inches above the surface floor of the user, and at that point, measure across the spray pattern. Uh, this is to assure it is a minimum of 20 inches wide, which is just over the average human shoulder spacing. Uh, this is just to ensure that whoever is using the shower, tall or short, is going to have complete coverage of their body while using the equipment. Low flows and injurious flows come into this too, in that when you have that low flow, which is incredibly important to test, the coverage is not going to get you shoulder, shoulder to shoulder. Um, unfortunately, we run a lot into a lot that are just trickling out of the unit. On the last slide, you can see on the right, uh, very minimum flow. This isn't going to cover somebody completely and not drench and uh, rinse contaminants from their body as effectively as it should. To test this, uh, simultaneous flow is very important again. We don't want anyone to need both and only have one. We don't want people to have to make a uh, hard decision here. So without flow controls in place, the water will take the path of least resistance and the shower will steal the water from the eyewash. So activate the shower, or, or the eye wash first, and then the shower, and watch for a dip in the flow. Uh, this is very, this is a huge issue with simultaneous flow, um, as it's, it's probably the most common one that I run into in the field, is, is the shower stealing all of the water from the eye wash, and somebody having to decide which one they're going to use. So Justin, we're getting a couple comments on that. Um, that is an issue that a lot of people are running into and it's uh, sometimes based off of the city water pressure. What are some of the solutions? So some of the solutions uh, that you can do are, uh, they range from inexpensive to very expensive, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of the times this is a plumbing issue. Uh, maybe it's too remote, you're covering too much um, distance in your piping. Booster pumps can be installed uh, to help, uh, again, push more water in the direction of the emergency equipment. Um, but other than that, you'll have to work with a, a, a plumber to make sure that your system is up to spec and that it is delivering water to different areas uh, the way it should be delivering water and it's not taking detours around your plant, um, which is really, unfortunately, a common issue. But booster pumps are something that can be really helpful. OK, well, with that answered, let's move on to the next slide. OK, so uh, tepid water. Uh, the unit must deliver tepid flushing fluid between 60 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 75% uh, of ophthalmologists say that having tempered water is very important citing it increases the chances that a victim can tolerate the 15-minute flush required. It also encourages victims to remove their clothing, which could be trapping contaminants against their skin. Tepid water gives the user a comfortable experience, and water in excess of 100 degrees can scald the soft tissue of your eye, your skin, below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and you have the high potential for hypothermia. Uh, this temperature was uh, determined by a test conducted by Navy SEALs, though. Um, and I don't know about you, but I'm no Navy SEAL. Uh, sitting in 60 degrees Fahrenheit water for 15 minutes is incredibly unpleasant. And anything under 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and you lose time very quickly before the onset of hypothermia. Um, so, again, very common in the field. Um, unfortunately, especially during these winter months, a lot of people don't accommodate for when they're doing their weekly testing, you're, you're going on, you're going off, you have flow to the unit, and you're done. What I would suggest, leave that on for a couple minutes. Let it run, because eventually you're going to get groundwater being pulled into that unit, and it is cold, and much colder than what's sitting in the pipes in your building. Let it run for a minute, throw the thermometer in, and you'll, you'll see something really surprising. 
there are fortunately uh, a lot of solutions for this though. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, drop the, thermo the thermometer into the five gallon bucket while conducting your flow rate test. Since it's the same water supply, usually, there is no need to test the eye wash and the shower separately. Uh, just get your temperature from the shower, you'll be just fine. On an eye wash only, just place the thermometer into the bowl and run the eye wash over the thermometer and you'll, you'll have your temperature uh, uh, in, a, in just a minute. Okay, now for uh, poll question three. Thank you again for your participation on these. Thanks, Justin. Um, we'd like to know, are weekly inspections currently being conducted on your equipment? Yes, no, you're not sure, or it's not applicable because maybe you don't have equipment. We're going to get into the weekly inspection requirements, uh, the very three basic requirements per ANSI here in just a minute, but we wanted to know how many of you, first of all, are aware of it, and second of all, know if they're being conducted each week. Uh, in the interim, we did have a question uh, about eyewash versus shower requirements and, and when an eye wash is applicable versus when an eye face wash is required versus when a combination unit is required. Um, and just emphasizing the importance of the right piece of equipment for the application. Um, I guess I'll touch on it. I just wanted to emphasize, we had a question come in, um, if we need an eye wash and a shower, and the question, or the answer is, depends on what the hazard is. The first step is to check your SDS. Um, that will help identify what your hazards are. Um, and then you really need to evaluate the different level of PPE that you have, um, your employees are using, if the potential for the contaminant to only affect the eyeballs would be when you would utilize an eye wash. So this is more airborne particulates, uh, shavings, dust hazards, uh, not necessarily chemical related. Um, if there is something chemical related and it could affect the eyes as well as the face, but not the body because you may have uh, full body coverage with PPE, then an eye face wash would be the right application. If you have the potential that contaminants could splash on the eyes, face, and the body, that's when a combination unit and full body coverage is necessary. Sorry to take away your uh, thunder, Justin, just wanted to touch on that as we continued through. So thanks everybody for answering the poll. We're going to get back into what the weekly requirements are. And not at all, that was a really good answer. Um, and it really just breaks down to eye wash uh, particulates in the air are, is really common, or really the only time you should be using that. Um, when you have corrosive materials uh, and chemicals, you should really be utilizing an eye face wash and shower um, in place of those eye washes. Okay, so uh, on to the next slide. Uh, all plumbed emergency eye washes, eye face washes, showers, and combination units shall be activated weekly as well as annually to ensure compliance with the ANSI ISEA standard. This ensures performance between annual tests, which is very important. You want this equipment to work every single time it's needed. You also never want to have to use it. So these weekly tests are incredibly important. So plumbed emergency eye washes, eye face washes and showers activated on a weekly basis. Activation shall ensure that the flow of the water to the heads of the device, okay? Uh, also, the duration of the activation needs to be sufficient to ensure that all stagnant water is flushed from the unit itself and clears all dead leg sections of the piping. Uh, we just want to make sure that we're clearing out any dusty or dirty, rusty water out of the system. Uh, which can be really common. We don't want a, somebody to activate it and immediately get a face full of, you know, really filthy water, which can build up in there. Um, and these are these are the bare minimum that ANSI requires you to do on a weekly basis. So ensure flow to the to the unit and clear the dead leg. Piece of cake. Uh, also, uh, the same rules apply to plumbed equipment that applies to portable and safe uh, and self-contained equipment. Um, the location, 15 minutes, tepid water, and all other measurements. The weekly activations, however, do not include activation. You only need to make sure that the stored flushing fluid is clean and at the proper fill height according to the manufacturer. 
All emergency equipment, including self-contained, shall be inspected annually to ensure conformance with the installation requirements of the standard. A again, the exact same as a plumbed piece of equipment. You just don't have to activate it, um, as that would drain or empty a portion of whatever it is that you have stored as the flushing fluid and will limit the amount of time that somebody can use it. So it is only a visual in inspection on the, the self-contained units. So for some of our additional best practices based on our experiences, um, we do suggest that you also check that the path of travel to the safety station is free of obstructions and we absolutely suggest that you check the tepid flushing fluid. If you're doing an annual test and that annual test is in the summertime or if it's in the winter time, uh, you're kind of missing out on uh, potential issues with your equipment. Running it uh, a, a temperature test during your weekly testing, even if it's once a month, uh, make sure you test that, that temperature because it can change all year round and you never know what you're going to get coming out of there and we want to make sure that it's tepid for whoever it is that's going to be using it. Okay. Uh, for the eye wash and eye face wash, make sure that the outlets are protected from airborne contaminants. You want to make sure that obviously the dust covers are in place. Um, sometimes I've seen uh, employees use an eye wash for the craziest things. You, I'm feeling a water bottle for crime and sake, like just all kinds of crazy stuff. They'll either washing their hands, but they won't replace that dust cap, and that can have uh, contaminants build up in those um, that piece of equipment. So we want to make sure the dust caps are in place. The valve needs to go from off to on in one second or less, and the flushing fluid needs to remain on without the use of the operator's hands. Uh, I, f I still find a lot of self-closing valves in the field, which were something that were popular uh, quite a long time ago, um, but you had to hold the pull rod or the push flag open to use the equipment. Uh, this doesn't allow you to disrobe, hold your eyes open, or, or deal with any other situation uh, at the time. Your hands are occupied holding the equipment open and if you let go it's going to turn off. Uh, so make sure it's, it's the proper type of valve that you have uh, in place. Uh, the flushing fluid of an eye wash and eye face wash shall cover the areas between the interior and exterior lines of a gauge. This is super easy. Just th I keep that eye wash gauge in your bucket, use it on a weekly basis, turn on the equipment. It's a quick check, and you'll know for sure that you are uh, within compliance, and this is going to work when it needs to. Uh, it needs to provide a uh, means of a controlled flow to both eyes simultaneously at a velocity low enough to be non-injurious. Uh, very important. Nobody wants to go up to use an eye wash and find out it's a brain wash uh, and you know damage their eyeballs or have to put up with that for 15 minutes. Uh, it's going to be super uncomfortable. So victim comfort is often not taken into account when we're talking about emergency equipment, which is really unfortunate. So I definitely suggest making sure that whoever it is that's going to be using this is going to have a comfortable experience. Uh, we don't need to be adding insult to injury here. The shower must deliver a minimum of 20 gallons per minute. Of course, use your buckets and your the shower sock. The valve shall go from off to on in one second or less, and flushing fluid shall remain on without the use of the operator's hands. Uh, same as the eye face wash, just make sure the valve is the proper type, not self-closing. For a combination unit, uh, the components shall be capable of operating simultaneously. Make sure whoever it is that installed this is not installing them incorrectly and make sure your safety team is aware that these pieces of equipment need to be used as one simultaneous use piece of equipment. Not not a piece of equipment, not an eye wash for one situation and a shower for another situation. We need to make sure they're aligned properly. Okay, and uh, only two more poll questions. All right, here we go. Poll question number four. Now that you've watched the webinar, but don't leave yet, we have a handful more slides. We'll get into the live Q&A and then give you an opportunity to get one of our HAWS representatives on site to check your equipment. Um, so don't leave yet. We just want to know, now that you've watched the meat of the webinar, in your opinion, how much of your equipment is fully ANSI compliant? Be honest with us. <laughs> I 
All right, looks like everybody is compliant. <laughs> we will move on to our survey program. To you, Justin. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And uh, now, real quick, I promise. Uh, I'd like to mention that Haas offers a complimentary emergency equipment survey uh, to assist you with your compliance. Okay. Now we offer uh, trained professional reps across the country that can provide one full day of testing absolutely free. Um, an inspection port, uh, report will be given to you detailing your compliance level for every piece of equipment uh, in your facility. We'll give you a troubleshooting guide that will tell you all of the issues that we ran across and how to fix those issues and a list of product recommendations that will solve any non-compliance issue that you have. This is so that you can take that list, you can do whatever it is that you want with it, um, and uh, we'll give you the tools that you need to bring those pieces of equipment into compliance. Uh, this is, of course, all completely confidential. We do not share that information with anybody. We are not uh, OSHA. We are not uh, enforcing um, uh, company so we are just we're just here to help and uh, to help you on your your path to, to compliance um, we also include a web conference and debriefing post survey to answer any questions you or your team have everybody can sit in and uh, you can talk to our subject matter experts uh, as to uh, your compliance how to reach compliance and how to use our suggestions to get there uh, some restrictions apply to the program. If you're out, way out in the middle of nowhere and I have a rep nearby, we will take care of it. But if uh, you are incredibly hard to reach or remote, uh, it may be very difficult. Uh, also, we there is a basic minimum for the for the program. We will do less than 10 assets if you have less than 10 pieces of equipment on your property. Um, but generally, we like to see 10 or more for uh, a full site survey. Uh, so if you are interested in learning more, uh, visit the link below and we can have a rep answer any question you might have and qualify for your site. On the right is an average based on 1,000 plus units surveyed. Uh, as you can see, the performance is overwhelmingly an issue. Uh, I, I cannot tell you how many times I've gone out into the field and I've seen simultaneous flow issues uh, positioning uh, requirements are ignored. Uh, the eye face wash is facing one direction, the shower is facing another, um, equipment's not being activated, um, et, et cetera. It, it goes on and on. Uh, but I'm really passionate about this program, and it is really a helpful resource for you and your compliance, and it's free. Uh, so feel free to share this if you'd like. Um, and that's, that's the end of my, my little survey program pitch, I promise. Uh, next, uh, Samantha is going to speak uh, to the next couple slides. Thanks, Justin. Uh, to make it a little easier on you, we're going to launch the next poll and you can just say yes or no whether you're interested in this complimentary site survey. Um, you're not locked in if you say yes, so say yes and we'll just reach out to you um, and we can get that scheduled with you. A really great opportunity to ensure you are compliant so our friends at OSHA don't come by and tag you for uh, silly non-compliance things such as a sign or, or well lit and also to ensure that if it is a non-silly non-compliant issue that we get that fixed for you. I'm going to give a couple more seconds so everybody can say yes. <laughs> All right, thanks. And if you did miss that poll question, uh, the link is in the chat and the link was on the slide before. So hosco.com forward slash survey. All right, uh, we're going to move a little bit into a service. Uh, we have a third-party independent provider that works uh, with us, and their company name is Zavato. Um, they are experts. They're field service experts, in specifically in emergency showers and eye wash equipment. Um, you can see all of the different offerings that they have here, startup and commissioning for any of your product that you may have just purchased. They'll 
conduct your ANS, annual ANSI inspection on every single piece of equipment. If you have hundreds and thousands, for example, Duke University has over a thousand different types of emergency eye wash and showers throughout their facility. They have contracted out Zavato to come every year and conduct those tests so they don't have to worry about it. Um, Zavato also offers an online competent person training and certification for $50. Um, that's a really great opportunity for those of you at the facility who are conducting the weekly and the annual inspections. I did have a question earlier if um, there has to be a particular person uh, that needs to have a certain certification to conduct these tests. Not necessarily, but it is a best practice that you have a subject matter expert conducting these tests and you can get that through um, this training course online for just $50. They'll do some wireless alarm site surveys. Uh, repair and upgrades, warranty service, and preventative maintenance and contracts. Pretty much anything you may need uh, service-wise on your equipment, Zavato's there for you. So you can visit their website at zavato.com. All right. Uh, next slide. Some of the resources we're going to provide you today for attending our webinar. Um, in the follow-up email, I'll ensure there is the weekly and annual inspection checklist. Uh, you'll get a link to the recording of today's live webinar. We'll pass over a best practices white paper. We touched on a lot of those best practices today um, because unfortunately the weekly testing is very minimal. Um, I'll send you information on that full testing kit, our Model 9011. Uh, another opportunity to say yes to our <laughs> complimentary site survey and then a link to our ANSI resources page that houses pretty much anything ANSI related Z358.1 that you may need. Okay, we have a ton of questions and I'm almost thinking we can skip some of the FAQ. We only have about six minutes. I wanted to answer as many as we can from you guys as well. And as Justin mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, if we don't touch on your question, we'll send a follow-up email in about a week uh, with answers to all of the questions that came from all of our attendees today. Uh, one of the first questions was, are squeeze bottles, or also known as personal emergency eye washes, ANSI compliant? Squeeze bottles are uh, an interesting topic. Um, these are supplementary equipment. Uh, they are absolutely compliant as long as they are used in tandem with full emergency equipment. So typically what you find is at the hazard, uh, whatever that is, you have that supplementary equipment. You have a squeeze bottle that will give you immediate relief that you use on your way to full eye, eye face wash shower equipment. So as long as that's the case, it is completely compliant and great. It's absolutely fantastic if you have that in your facility because it's giving somebody immediate relief from whatever it is that, you, that you're suffering from or, or have been exposed to. So you use that supplementary equipment on your way to the equipment and you're, you're good to go. Thanks Justin and thank you everybody for the questions. It's overwhelming in a good way. Um, what are some solutions for eye washes that are over uh, 100 degrees Fahrenheit temperature due to something like piping in the sun? So when you have that type of issue, uh, ideally relocating the piping, uh, rethinking your, uh, the area that you've provided the equipment in uh, is really great. You can insulate the piping. There are chilling options out there that will chill the water to the equipment, uh, provide a tepid water at uh, about 85 degrees. Um, this is a really serious issue. There are, of course, applications where this equipment has to be on the rooftop, uh, where it has to be at fuel filling stations, things of that sort but insulate the piping. There are chilling options out there available to you. Uh, if you if you search them out, they're easy to find. Um, and uh, try to shield the equipment from the sun if you can. Uh, provide a, a mezzanine, something to, to put it underneath to shield it from the, from the sun and direct sunlight. And if you can, have a plumber reposition the piping so that it's running in the shade and it's not as exposed to the sun as it normally is. Great, thanks. Um, a couple people have asked about the drainage aspect. You talked about how many gallons it is uh, per minute for the full 15 minute flush. It is a lot of water. Can you touch on the drainage aspect? Drains. Back to my 
back to my ANSI wish list. Uh, drains are a huge issue, and it's a, one of the most common questions that I get um, because it's it's not something. Unfortunately, sometimes it's not something you can provide everywhere. Um, if the equipment's outdoors, obviously that's not an issue. But inside your facility, again, 300 plus water uh, uh, gallons of water is going somewhere in your facility. It's ruining drywall. If there's sensitive equipment nearby, you're it's in danger. Um, things of that nature. And having a drain nearby is awesome. If you can locate your equipment near a drain, that's fantastic. But ANSI does not require you to have a drain. And I, I get that question constantly. There is no requirement for drainage for emergency equipment yet. Uh, what I would suggest, relocate equipment if you can. Um, obviously, if it's outdoors, you don't need to. But uh, it's it's definitely it's an important issue, and it needs to be touched on soon, I think. All right, I think we just have time for one more question for now. We'll allow you guys to get ready for your next meetings. Um, what areas of the U.S. does your third party Zavato cover? She hit me with an easy one. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere, ever. So, um, Zavato will literally, they will travel to every corner of this globe to help you with your with your services uh, or whatever it is that you need in your issues they will fix them from Australia to Japan to here at home so if you have issues they will they will work with you and they will make sure that they uh, schedule it and travel to your area whatever it is that you need all right I think that's about it um, thank you all so much for taking the time today. Again, as we mentioned, two follow-up emails coming, uh, one with a link to the on-demand recording of today's webinar, a bunch of resources. In addition, for attending, uh, there will be an attachment of a fillable PDF. Uh, it's an attendance certificate for all of you who attended, so there are instructions on how you fill that out manually so you can receive that certificate and uh, send that into any organization that you may be a part of for uh, training. Um, and then a second follow-up about a week later that'll have answers to all the questions today. And I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. I know uh, you're very busy and uh, thank you for taking your time out of your day to uh, to join us. Uh, compliance, ANSI, these types of issues and fixing them are very important to myself and Sam and we just wanted to say thank you for everybody for uh, joining us on this and please um, uh, good luck on your complaints. And, uh, and let us know if you need anything. Thanks, everybody. Have a great turkey day.